Hi, welcome everybody to our continuing series with uh, outstanding conductors from Hong Kong and today from Macau as well, uh, Liu Guokman. Leo, welcome. Hello, hello, Jay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, we have a very enthusiastic audience today who have already sent in a lot of questions. Um, so I would like to just jump into it and um, have everyone get to know you uh, even better. So uh, actually, I'm also very curious because uh, coming from Hong Kong and Macau and actually in Asia, in many countries in Asia, you, you don't normally think of conductors as the most popular instrument like choice <laughs> <laughs> yeah in music choice. <laughs> yeah and a lot of people don't know how we get started you mm -hmm. someone like you would get started on this path so could we start maybe with um your own background and you know how did you get into conducting or other instruments first well um yeah it is true uh, to uh, to be a conductor is almost like there's no um path of doing it and for me um Actually, I really wanted to be a conductor since really, really young. Um, it was the first concert I went to that inspired me. And I was so shocked by the sound. And well, shock might not be the right word, but I was so really inspired by the, the, the sound of the orchestra. And then, um, you know, for a four years old boy to, to sit in a concert for two hours, my mom was in shock as well. So mm. she asked, she said, well, it seems you really like the music uh, well. That means you have a chance to be a, uh, more, you know, uh, quiet and to learn some music. Well, so she asked me, would you like to learn piano? I said, I want to be the conduct. No, I want to be the one with the, the chopstick, the one, the guy. <laughs> so so she, yeah. she said, no, that is a conductor. But uh, well, uh, why don't you go to, um, I bring you to have some piano lessons. I said, of course, uh, that means I could go out to have lessons of the uh, apartment, right? Yeah. So I said, yes, of course. So, uh, um, and then I started piano lessons and that really started. And, and yes, I, I, but it was the, 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 that image of my head that I keep telling myself, I want to be the conductor. So um, in the high school, I started to join um, the, the August Youth Orchestra, play violins and play trombones. Um, and to just to get get used to making music with uh, or making well making friends and making music together. Yeah. So um, but, you know, I, I love that feeling to be on stage together. Um, although I, I still really focus on piano. So um, I finished. Um, I went to Hong Kong, uh, APA Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts to study piano. And when I graduated, um, I moved to New York to do that school. Oh, so, okay. Also for piano. Um, and really, uh, until I finished my master's, master's degree, um, I told myself, well, now this is the point that maybe I could try if this dream can happen. So then I auditioned for Curtis for conducting. Oh, okay. And I got in. And that is oh. really how I, I have to say, step my foot into the chance of being a conductor. It's really starting from that moment, from Curtis. Okay. Well, I have to, I mean, go back just a little. I, I'm sorry. I, for those of you who might not be totally familiar with your, um, with Leo's career, I just have to mention just a, wow. a very few highlights, just so everybody has a taste of really what you've been doing since, I mean, you won a major competition, which, um, where, can you tell us? In about Paris, that's a land of competition, yes. Yeah. Yes. In Paris. And in Paris, right. And mm -hmm. since then you've, performed and conducted with all these major orchestras around the world, in Europe, the Radio Philharmonic of France, and Toulouse, the capital yeah. orchestra of Toulouse, and Marinsky, and of course, all over Asia, and in America, Philadelphia, which we'll get to, because I think that was probably quite an important part of your career. Mm. Um, so, and then um, besides that, you're all, you've also become um, programming or artistic director of the Macau Festival. And very recently, yes. on your website, <laughs> you are also interested in chamber music or you did, you found yes, actually, yes. chamber music, Society of Macau and so that. We got to talk more about that. <laughs> That's very interesting okay. as well. Um, so anyway, now that everybody's all caught up, 
Um, yeah, so you went to Curtis. And, but how did you, I mean, when you auditioned for Curtis as a conductor without any, a lot of conducting training, what was that like? How did you prepare for that? Um, yeah, that was a difficult one. Um, when, when I was in high school, even though I was uh, in the orchestra, I started, um, I would say, doing a little bit of conducting just when the conductors, I think every youth orchestra is like this, when the conductor suddenly decide, oh, he could not be there on that this afternoon, then maybe one of the students would come up and just, just to rehearse something or go through the piece. So um, I do some of that. So, um, and then when I was uh, doing all my time um, learning piano, I focused a lot, as you mentioned, chamber music. I played so many chamber music. All the concertos I played, um, basically, uh, all the concertos and friends asked me, hey, would you like to play for me in my concerto exam? I would, no, normal pianist would be like, no, 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 I have to learn my sonata. I, I would do it. Let, 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 me, let me do it. You know, so I, because I want to, I think for me, I am curious of other instruments, how they play and how they make the sound. And I could get to have lessons with their teacher. So I learned how, how, what the teacher would tell the students to fix and to change. So even though I don't play the instrument, I have a sense of the sound, how to create that in my head. So that helped me a lot. Um, and then, yes, and then um, it was in also the Macau Youth Orchestra, which I was used to play trombone and violin. Um, they asked me, well, we, I was still at the APA in Hong Kong studying piano. They asked me, well, uh, since you play so many concertos, would you like to have your first concert? Just conducting concertos, concerto nights. I was like, yes, of course, okay. yes, conducting. So that was my first concert with audience in the back and it's just concerto concert. And, and because I play all the concertos, I know them really in my heart. So what I need to do is start learning the score. And so, okay, now the full score is like this and this is the is which instrument coming in. So yeah, yeah that, that really um, was my first a little touch of being a conductor. Uh -huh. yeah. So then you got into Curtis's conducting program Mm -hmm. And how did then your career move on from there? Because so obviously, you, while you were learning all the skills and the knowledge, there were mm -hmm. other opportunities that came up, right? Uh, you had yeah. to do the competition, and then you became assistant. Yes, with the Philadelphia. Yes, yes. Um, it was 2014 was my big um, uh, year breakthrough uh, in okay. terms of career. Um, first, I won the, uh, well, the first the assistant, they normally they will stay, they don't have opening, there's, there's no audition. So the assistant left, so um, they open audition. And uh, somehow my name was mentioned um, to one of the committee member and a pool of like 50 conductors. And this was in the Philadelphia, in Philadelphia Orchestra. Orchestra. Okay. Yes, so, yeah. so they sent me a, an email. They said, well, we have heard of you. You graduate from Curtis and you have done this, this, this. So we maybe would you like to send in some resume or something? And no, normally orchestra do would do that quite often if they have an opening to just reach out to people. So um so I said, of course I would love to. Uh, so I send in resume and I uh pass the audition. Well off uh, the audition, the orchestra has to vote, the music director has to vote. So really it's the audition in front of um everyone for orchestra. Um, and then after that, the same year, I won the competition in Paris. Uh, the Svetlanov what competition. What was the name of the competition? Svetlanov. Svetlanov. Oh, Svetlanov, of course. Svetlanov, yes. yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Um, and in fact, before the competition, two weeks before, I was thinking maybe I should not go. Because, because I said, well, I, I'm already now in Philadelphia, maybe I should focus in this and all of that. So, so really, uh, yeah. we, two weeks before, I finally decided, well, Mm. This either this will be last. This will be my last competition. That's uh -huh. it. <laughs> so, so I told myself, okay. So now work hard, do it. And and I flew there, and luckily I I, I got an, an award, um, and that opened up um, some of my opportunities in uh, in Europe, um, and then one thing leads to another, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm. And um, so then, but at the same time, you were chosen for the Philadelphia Orchestra Assistantship. 
Mm-hmm. And um, under, was this already under Yannick? Yeah, this is again. So again, who, right, right. as everybody knows, is one of the great conductors today. Mm-hmm. Um, c- perhaps, was there something really in particular that you took away from working with him that you think has still helped you today? Because, I, you know, uh, so many people talk about him when he's mm-hmm. up on the podium. He's so inspiring. Mm-hmm. And orchestras really just follow him. So, you know, there must be something that you perhaps observed or learned from him. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. The two years, well, two, uh, three years uh, that I, um, with the Philadelphia of Orchestra, I learned so much. It's really valuable. Um, first of all, uh, with the orchestra, I, I am full time there. So, not only um, in the rehearsal and concert, and I work very closely with the administration. So that really helps me to really know how the organization actually how it works. So in terms of prepare myself to well, one day eventually have my have my own orchestra or running my association, for example, I know how to have more experience. Um, and in terms of working with uh, Yannick, uh, yes, absolutely, he's one of the most amazing conductor that I've ever seen or human being I've ever seen. He has this um, positive energy, and 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 then to bring everyone together to create something. And it's really, and plus he's a great listener. So it's really, um, um, he, can, he can get the really always the best result. And it's fantastic oh. to, to, see, to see how he could create that. And that influenced me a lot, actually. I really like what the things you just mentioned because these qualities, the being positive, mm-hmm. and then inspiring people that way, but also listening. Great listener, yeah. That's, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, because, you know, today's theme, we want to talk about leadership and teamwork. And a lot of people, I think when they think of leadership, they don't realize there's so much of it is about listening, isn't it? Right, you're right. You're absolutely right. Just leading. Exactly. uh, Yeah. 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 Listening I think, is the most important. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So when you're conducting then, I mean, how do you balance the need, like, you know, when you're standing in front of 100 people? or mm. 80 people, whatever, and mm. who all have their own artistic personalities. How do you balance this listening and leading? And, you know, this is probably the trickiest thing as a conductor, mm. isn't it? knowing how much to lead or just sometimes letting the orchestra play or what? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a philosophy that I think Carl Young once said, I, and I, I always uh, like to quote that one. So Carl Young said, when you conduct an orchestra, it's almost like you're riding the horse. Uh-huh. So you think you're riding the horse, but in fact, the horse is riding you. Uh-huh. But what, who comes first, right? right, and, right. But also you have to give the leadership to the horse so that the horse knows what you are doing, right? So that goes with this whole orchestra or, or anything in leadership. If you just keep beating, beating, or just not listening, how they react to the reaction, it doesn't uh-huh. work, right? So that yeah. is also, I, I, yeah, I, I always like to quote this, this one. Yeah. Well, I also think a lot of, I hear from other people, I think um, there's a big element of psychology involved mm-hmm. in there in order to be able to read people, to learn how to read people. And that's something else that I think a lot of great yeah. leaders and yeah. teamwork, right? When right. you know, when you are able to sense, oh, is it yeah, too the sense. Much? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, the sense. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I guess the sense thing could come from, First of all, you have to be a sensitive person, but also also come from, well, training your ears. Um, I remember I was watching one documentary of James Levine and then mm-hmm. the Met Opera and then the trombone player, he, he said once that he said, well, normally James Levine doesn't really pay too much attention on the trombone. Just as long as it's not too loud, you know, so we play. And then he said that one day I changed just one little thing on the trombone to make the sound a little rounder. Suddenly, Normally, no, no, no one really noticed except he, maybe his colleague next to him. And he oh. said in the rehearsal, suddenly when I come in, he said, Jimmy, just start standing and then looking at me for five seconds. So that comes from great listening. And that's also what you were talking about, the sense. You know, yeah. how you sensing, you know, you have, it's true, you have a hundred people on stage. And how you could feel that, well this is going to happen like this. Well, this doesn't go so well. Well, this part is coming in and it's difficult. I need to fix that. And how you balance all of that. And in that split second, you have to make the decision. And I get that this difficult and needs um, experience. 
True, absolutely. I mean, I cannot imagine the first time. I don't know if you remember maybe the, your first time standing in front of such a big orchestra, orchestra. what that was like. Oh, I, I remember. Yeah, it's, it's like you give a downbeat and like the sound is like, where's the sound? And after five seconds, bang! You know, the delay of orchestra. We talk yeah. about this. And yeah. people ask you always, like, they say, why the orchestra doesn't come with you? And you come down beat, the sound comes immediately. Well, because orchestra, right? Well, I'm sure you know, you know uh, the orchestra has their own sound when they want to have this coming together, that moment, and it's their, they're used to it. So, I, yeah, I remember that the first moment I was like, why there's no sound? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think already we're getting questions from coming oh, in live wow. and also pre-registered um, questions. So I think we could just jump right into it. Because okay. Yeah. There's a lot that people want to know from you. Um, you know, just going back a little towards the more educational part, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the building up to becoming a conductor. A lot of okay. people, for example, we have a question, what should I do to equip mm -hmm. myself to be a conductor during secondary school? And I think you already covered a little bit about mm. that, right? Some well, advice? If, you are in, if you're in secondary school, that's fantastic because you, you have more time to, um, first of all, pick an instrument. You have to be a musician you have to be a musician. Well, pick one first, and okay. be really, really good. Pick one first and be really focused in it because, most importantly, conducting is not just waving and then you're a conductor. You have to be a musician first, mm. an right? instrumentalist. Yeah. Well, yes. And if you say, well, you know, I started really late. I I would never be as good as a concert pianist. It does not matter. Most importantly, you can have to. The full score has at least uh, 25 to 40 lines. And you have mm. to be able to look at all of it and play on the piano. Or if you're a violinist, play on a violin. Or a cellist, you play on a cello, right? You have to know all of this. You cannot just be like, ah, in any recording, this is like this. Then you wave the hand, I learned this. This is actually <laughs> not conducting. You know, it looks like this, but this is not conducting. Not Harry Potter. <laughs> exactly, you know, this magic, you know, no. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and also there's exception. If you say, well, you know, I really can do that then. Be a composer. Be a focused oh. composer. So you can see that all the good maestros out there, they're either fantastic musicians starting from instruments, mostly piano, and then mm -hmm. all composer like uh, Esther Pekka, Salonen. Oh, yeah. Right? But I'm yeah. sure he could play on piano. When I, I remember so clearly when I was working with Gurdjieff, I was, uh, I was uh, asking him some questions. And without a score, he came on the piano and played uh, La Mer, the difficult cello section. But um, <laughs> uh, so difficult. And he's played it like fluently. So uh, these are the musicianship that we're talking about. And be a good conductor, you have to have be a good musician first. Yeah, well, that's very good. You mentioned that because we, another question was also asking how many instruments oh. do you think is necessary. But I think what you just said, at least one, right? At least but, one, yeah. But I think more the, the more the better, but then again, you don't want to yeah. be overstretched and not yeah, focused. Yeah, but that, that's true. But I guess uh, I need to rephrase it. At least one that you focus, but even the instrument that you don't play, you have to have um, the curiosity to, to know. If, let's say if you play a violin, would you come to see a piano recital? Would you come to see a, let's say, a cello sonata recital to know how Brahms sonata would, would do? If you don't know Brahms sonata, you cannot conduct Brahms symphony. Mm -hmm. that, just, that just, if you don't know the piece, because this comes to all together. So I think it's important to, to, to go to more concerts. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, that's so good because it's so often, right? <laughs> um, when we're just obsessed with our own instrument. Yeah. About other yeah. repertoire. And of course, the orchestra repertoire is the biggest and best. <laughs> <laughs> Although pianists might disagree. <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, I, I guess all repertoire is in, it's equally important. I mean, I mean, if you are, yeah, really, you have to have, you have to even know how many tuba concertos, uh, for example, you know, so or at least know some <laughs> of them, you know. So, yeah. so otherwise, you, how would you conduct an orchestra and the tuba player is there and then what, how you could talk to him, what, you, yeah. what sound you want, you know. Mm -hmm. True. Mm. Well, 
I think that, you know, there are a couple, just a few more questions about this area, which is that um, in general, what mm -hmm. criteria do you think is necessary to be a conductor? And one of them is, do you think it's necessary to study conducting in the postgraduate level? And that's in order to begin your career. And I think for you, that's quite mm -hmm. interesting because while you were studying and right after your studies, your career was already sort of launching, but then you kept studying or you, did you not finish or? <laughs> well, I guess the, f the first thing is when you should start conducting. And in fact, most schools require postgraduate studies for conducting. Okay. Yeah, okay, most good. schools. Yeah, for example, when I was auditioning at, uh, yeah, ex at that time, Julia does not offer master's uh, undergraduate degree for conducting. Um, for Curtis, they normally accept um, the age limit to 21, but conducting they accept to 28. So most schools, they accept uh, um, only for postgraduate actually. So well, if you want to, yeah. So if you want to start early, yes. So if you audition to school, uh, you got accepted. Well, fantastic. But um, yeah, that's a different path. Yeah. So actually, uh, we just got another question about that. There's a, is, a, um, is it important or is it a good idea to study conducting for undergraduate? But I guess it really depends, doesn't it? Exactly. Because, um, yeah. Whether the school offers it and whether yeah. you're ready, uh, you yeah. know, because like you said, maybe you should focus more first on your own instrument and learning about right. general repertoire. So mm -hmm. it's all very personalized, right? The whole yeah. path. There's no set right. path for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, you know, we have a very funny question here, which I think we also <laughs> talked about. And then okay. this person asked, why is leadership important in music? I thought to be a follower and know how to cooperate is enough. Ha! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's more of a balance, isn't it? Fantastic question. I love it. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I talked about a little bit that I love chamber music and that's really how also inspired me to how I see what myself as conductor, how to lead the orchestra is really from chamber music. Um, yeah. And I remember one lesson with Gonnery Quartet. So we were playing, I was playing, I think one of the piano quintet or something and the Gonnery Quartet was coaching us. So it just, we never played together. It just, the downbeat just, just doesn't sound right. Uh -huh. So and then they, they stop, you know, they, I guess that's happened all the time in chamber, in, the, in chamber music. Well, the first one is like, how come not together? Well, not together. So right. he said one thing, you need to do, he said, look at the first violin. You need to lead and then you follow. Oh, I'll never forget. Wait, he was saying this to who? To, to, to the first violin. Because the, first the first violin, because the first violin is the one to lead this call. We agree, of course, we are signed. Well, this one, we all look at the first violin. Okay. So we look at the first violin, and it just somehow never together. So, and then he talked to the first violin. <laughs> at that moment, I was like, Che, you know, this is like, uh, so you, you have a lot of uh, uh, comment on this. Uh, this is your, your whole, uh, uh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> but so, so he said, you lead, but then you follow. So, so this, this means... Is he leading or is he just following? He's doing both actually. And then magically it's together. We are played together all the time in that moment. Right. See, so is, I get, yeah. I mean, what you just said, magically yeah. it's together. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is what but it works. I think for a lot of, but for a lot of young people, I think that's, we, it's still a very abstract concept, right? How does mm -hmm. it work? <laughs> You just basically have to have experience when it comes down to it. You have to keep trying it, right? Yeah, yeah, keep trying it. But also, I guess when you really think you're following, let's say in chamber music, mm -hmm. if you think you're following, let's say in orchestra, the last stand of viola, for example, right? Is it just following? Yeah. Then what would happen? One is following the other, the other following the other, the other following the other. It's getting slower and slower, right? Later and later, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. no, you somehow, you are in, always in this balance of following and leading and following. It's never just passive. And, and it's never just really aggressive, like I'm just the one leading in front. Uh -huh. 
You yeah. see? So yeah, so that is a fascinating question. I hope I answer <laughs> answer. No, oh, I think that's it. perfect. <laughs> well, I think it's what you said is right because it's it's not clear cut really. At the exactly. End. Yeah. You yeah, have to have yeah. a bit of everything in music. Yeah. Whether right. you're the conductor or the first violinist or the last yeah, one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, okay. yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, well, ha, now we have another two questions I have to say for you that has to do with your time on the podium. One is, how can you remain calm while performing in front of an audience? And what might be your greatest fear when conducting? <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think they're quite related, aren't they? Yeah. Well, the first question, how do I keep calm? Does that, is that, does that mean that would I be stage fright or calm? I'm guessing, yeah, yeah. to remain clear-headed yeah. and not yeah. freak out. <laughs> well, normally when I'm doing the rehearsal process, um, after the dress rehearsal, the final dress rehearsal, then I will have a, f I will try to, you know, keep myself calm. Of course, I would get nervous, of course. Um, sometimes very nervous, just an hour before and, and yeah. but, but the moment that I walk on stage, 99% I forget all the fears. Hmm. The moment I walk on stage, then when I just thinking about the music, thinking about how we rehearsed, how we worked on it, how, and then I look at the smile of the play players or the response of the musician or the clapping from the audience, then I know that I have to forget all of this and just make music. And that helps me a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, so I would not say how do I keep calm or keep not nervous, not nervous or all this. I just think about music on stage. I actually wow. have a, sorry, but yeah, yeah. related to that, I personally, I'm, I have a curiosity, which is, you know, as an instrumentalist, you know mm. what it's like to be nervous, right? Uh, I can mess up, literally. Uh, I can miss a note. I can do this. But as a conductor, what are you nervous about? <laughs> giving the wrong cue? Or <laughs> Yes, giving the wrong cue is, uh, you know, uh, it's a 3-4, you conduct 4-4, four, four, you miss a bar, you miss a beat, <laughs> <laughs> start an hour, and then orchestra stops and collapsed, and then you know, someone come in wrong. Well, things, things can happen on stage. Many things can happen on stage. But I guess it took me a while, actually, to get over that, is to uh -huh. enjoy the moment of being on stage. Yeah. Because you're not, it's not going to be as perfect that it's not a live music, live, live music, who knows what would happen? Yeah. And that's a fun part to go to the city concert, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially I mean, how, right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but how, I mean, it's a good question. But Trey, uh, how about I ask you, how do you get over the stage fright before oh. on stage, going on stage? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what you just said, um, the one word that was very important is enjoy. Yeah. Um, right. Because yeah, obviously, right, right we've right. all, you know, we've all put in the work beforehand. So mm -hmm. you know in the back of your mind, okay, I am physically capable of mm -hmm. doing what is required. Then it's the next level is the psychological level, the mental level to say, yes. okay, now how do we put that into a form where we enjoy it and yet still, of course, maintain the technical level? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very important what you said. Yeah, enjoying the moment. Yeah, enjoy, yeah. I, I, like, I, I like the word enjoy. It's really important. If you don't enjoy, how can the audience enjoy what we're doing? Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So what is yeah. your greatest fear? <laughs> 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 like you just said, maybe, right? The <laughs> things collapsing or what? <laughs> um, my greatest fear? I mean, maybe. I think uh -huh. in a way this question is not even should not be asked this way because I don't think fear is a good way to approach any performance, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I would not be afraid. Fear. Yeah. Exactly. I, I yeah. think I think it's natural that people ask this because we all have fears and insecurities, especially artists, as you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, 
but I think if you approach the stage with any kind of fear, that's already you're already kind of losing the battle. Yeah, it's more about uh, you. And you know what you said about Yannick having such positive, uh, positive energy. Yeah, and that's really the the thing we all need to take with us on stage, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You have to be a positive energy once you on stage. You have to have the. It's like you're going to a uh, a football match. You have to have the right mentality and going for it. Well, I mean, for football match, you will win, you will lose. For music, we are enjoying the music on stage. So how lucky is that? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> football, any kind of performance, right, in, yeah. in front of an audience. Well, let's go to another. This is a very interesting question. What is from your experience, because you've done both, what can you learn from conducting operas which you cannot learn from symphonies or concertos, conducting symphony? What, uh, well, in opera, the text, the language, mm -hmm. um, it's important, very, very important. And to knowing every single word, what they are saying, and the meaning behind it, not just the, the translating in Google, but the meaning is uh -huh. then subtext of, of this line to, so that could influence that. Of, of course, the composer would think about that before they write the aria. Yeah. So that you have to understand and that um, takes uh, a lot of time, of course, but also is fascinating. And then, and then to help me to read it in, in depth of the emotional level, um, when the composer composing it and how I could understanding it and to influence the singer or me to or to understanding the singers and that's important mm. in opera yeah okay I was just yeah. thinking wondering if this analogy would apply at all would conducting a symphony be like directing traffic on the road and conducting <laughs> opera directing air traffic <laughs> uh, I mean, I've seen in operas the conductors having to worry about both in the pit and on stage, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, you have a whole a pit, a full of musician of ninety-five musician in front here, and then right. the pit. Sometimes in in Marinsky, the pit was like so far away that you cannot see the singers. Oh, like, really? The singers right there, and and then you try to see and to influence. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> It's another, another, well, I, I enjoy it so much. And actually for me, um, I also play a lot for opera singers in our years. Um, and also that helps me a lot, um, mm -hmm. being, a com uh, being a accompanist to play for them, knowing their breath. And by knowing um, how singers, different voice type, how they f make a phrase, that yeah. also influenced me a lot in making music in orchestral work, actually. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of, I've had teachers also tell me, you know, listen to singers and how they breathe. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. How you yeah. phrase music a lot of times. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, speaking of how to work with them, we have a question live here, um, I, which I find very interesting, which is, how do you strike a balance during rehearsals, you know, keeping it, keeping their attention and also sometimes if it's necessary, um, making it fun, but also mm -hmm. efficient and effective, you know, basically I think the question is about how do you lead a rehearsal in an effective way? Because yeah. like we were saying before, you have a hundred people with different artistic personalities and probably mm. different opinions about how the music should go. Mm. I, you know, I guess this also goes back, right, to how to be a leader in that situation. Yes, uh, a great question, by the way. Um, maybe I could share how my, when I first started, um, mm, yeah, please. I was like, no, this is not right. No, this has to fix it. No, just because, <laughs> You know, yeah, naturally, I have this in my head. I worked on the music. I know this is right. This is not no. And then I said, no, 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 no. And and then it gets so tense and uh, doesn't get the best result. And I could see that the musicians they are not enjoying the process. And then naturally, they don't play as as naturally as as they could play, not as singing as they could sing in the instrument. 
So, and that, um, yeah, I, it took me a while to, 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 to really understanding the rehearsal process because ultimately you want to come from A to this finish point. Mm -hmm. And how you do this, you want to just go right there or you want to do it step by step and then let the people knowing that what you are aiming for here. And that's mm -hmm. important. So, um, for example, let's say uh, that's 10 things, okay, um, I would like to fix. Um, and I would tell myself, first of all, do I have time for this, these 10 things? Because yeah. sometimes in rehearsal, in American orchestra, sometimes you have one rehearsal and a concert. And sometimes yeah. the rehearsal, the rehearsal time is shorter than concert time, you know? So you don't right. even play for everything. So what can I fix? So these 10 things, should I tell them this one, two, three, and then I will play again four, five, six, and we really work hard on it because that needs more attention. Or maybe some of them I could just, after rehearsal, I could tell one player, well, this note is, is a little flat. Maybe you could think about this. Then you already fixed it. So yeah. how to, to time it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, I have to say I constantly, constantly to think about if I use the time wisely, if yeah. I surf, I guess if I, if I serve the musician the best I can, because ultimately I'm the one to serve the musician. They are one to play. Yeah. So, so again, you're not just leading. You have to kind of listen. prioritize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe um, uh, the words that come to my mind are maybe prioritize and strategize. Strategize, yeah. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned 10 problems, but they're not equally important. So you have to prioritize which, yeah, 10, exactly. which yeah. of the 10 to go first, right? Mm -hmm. And then strategize how to convince people to mm -hmm. do what you want, maybe. I, this is right. all very uh, psychoanalytical, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is I, true. I love it. I, I, I think it's so interestingly complex uh, because it's not just about music making, it's about psychology, it's about interpersonal, uh, in course, um, interactions, it's about, yeah. team, well, it's about teamwork. collaboration, teamwork, yeah, yeah, teamwork, uh, mm -hmm. exactly. collaboration. Well, uh -huh. I, I, well that, I think that's, I mean, oh, that answer can only come from somebody who's had the experience, I have to say, <laughs> because I think until you get there, you really cannot imagine what it's like. Um, now here's an interesting question, and I promise this is not from me. How do you select soloists, and what qualities do you look for? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, great question. Um, uh, most of the time, it comes from discussion with the orchestra president, actually, or the artistic director because um, for example if I'm guest conducting uh, an orchestra then then they will have a list of um, artists that they are already planning to engage and they will match the conductor for the season uh, or maybe sometimes sometimes the soloist would be um, introduced by other people other friends um, conductors so um, really from uh, Every time uh, it's different situation of the mm -hmm. selection of the soloist. Um, yeah. Uh, and but most of the time it's really true. But hmm? if it's up to you, then the qualities this person's asking about. I oh, guess. the quality. The quality. Um, I mean, obviously there are very basic ones, like they have to be mm. of a certain level technically, but also expressively probably because mm. you want someone in front of a live audience who will yeah. be able to communicate with them and and not just you know go into the turtle shell <laughs> right exactly exactly you yeah that's that's the, the yeah, great point um i guess the great quality of a soloist that let me put it this way the, the soloist that i would like to work with mm -hmm. That I really more enjoy to work with is, as you said, it's not just playing in their shell. I know you practice this concerto. I know that you play this way, this tempo, this speed, and you take time here. Fine. But are you listening to the orchestra? Are mm -hmm. you, when you've learned the concerto, did you look at the full score? Um, you know which line is actually playing with you. That comes from the, uh, comes from the question that we talk about. Are you just leading in front? 
or actually sometimes uh-huh. you're following because you're accompanying the clarinet playing the solo and yes. then you're just accompanying the clarinet so you have to look at the clarinet not just like keep playing you know with your piano for example so yeah. um yeah so that's the, the the quality that i or the solo is that i enjoy working with basically more. i mean that sounds like to me what you would look for is a true musician <laughs> right somebody who is able to yeah who not only knows his or her part but knows the whole piece every exactly point. exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah which is what a true musician is not just somebody mm. who's all practicing 10 hours a day on their own lines mm. and i think this is so important for our listeners especially those who are in school right now mm. you know, who want to become soloists or chamber musician or any you know orchestra conductor anything the idea right is to really know the whole picture to yeah. be aware and to listen like a you know team player or a leader and, and at the same time so again this is very helpful i think what you're saying to our listeners um so one more question before we move maybe to the last group of questions which i think um comes to more today but just a quick question we have from a, a live question here about competitions i think we already mm-hmm. covered it it's like basically they wanted to know how you approach competitions but i think before you had mentioned how you were focused on your instrument and learning about how to listen and about the different composers and getting into lessons with other teachers right mm. Yes, I guess um, this question, <clears throat> I don't know if the, the person is uh, talk, asking about conducting competition or just yes, general, conducting competition. Conducting competition. Um, well, I see a competition is a entrance ticket to, let's say, Ocean Park or Disneyland. <laughs> to get into it. But then once you get into it, you have to earn your right. To, to do all the rides, you have to get another ticket, you know, so, so it is, it helps to get into the door, but um, it's not, well, it helps, but it's not the, the only thing, and it's not the most important thing. You mean doing a competition? Doing the competition. Okay, so the yeah. attitude then, the approach, should not be that this is what will guarantee absolute yeah. success or that I absolutely have to win gold medal and then that's it, right? The idea is that maybe it's just part of the process of becoming a conductor. Yeah, I guess uh, to, to, I guess same as, that's why I asked this question is the person specifically about conducting competition. But for me, every competition is the same. It's the process mm-hmm. that matters. How you prepare for it, are you ready for it? When you are there, do you see what other people is doing? How could that change you? Why they get the prize or why they don't get the prize? So that it's um, the process is more important. And yes, if you win, that's fantastic. If you don't win, that is an experience as well. So I guess it's important to go to competitions, but yeah. um, but. Uh, if you say that, well, uh, this competition is the only thing to have a career, uh, uh, no. I mean, mm-hmm. I guess if, uh, for us as a musician's career, it's a really long career, you know, mm-hmm. and how you maintain the career is more important. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I think. Um, we're just a few more quick questions. We're just, they're just coming in so fast right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, but, I don't see um, questions, so please. Uh, Tell me. No, but I think this question we also kind of covered before, which is asking, uh, do you have a different mindset playing solo piano and conducting? You know, because before I said, okay, as an instrumentalist, we could really just screw up the notes or whatever. Mm. Whereas conducting is a different type of worries that you have to mm. keep in mind, right? So mm. what is, I guess for you personally, since you were all, you're also a pianist and than a conductor. So what is the difference when you're performing as either one? Um, <clears throat> different mindset. Nowadays, I don't feel that much of a difference. But mm. before that, before I 
pick up conducting or be a conductor, I feel a little loneliness on stage. <laughs> because as a pianist. As a pianist. Because oh. when you get off, you no, know, you walk from the stage door and then you walk to the piano, that's five seconds feels so long. Oh. And then <laughs> and then, you know, on the stage, empty stage, you only see your piano and then um, well, okay, I bow and I sit down and I feel that well. I'm the only one, no one talking to me, no one giving me a smile, no one, <laughs> you know, no one like giving yeah. any reaction. So actually you, I have this little habit of myself, uh, now I can share it. When I sit down at the piano, I would touch basically just to wipe all the white keys, just wipe this and then I would say, oh, be my friends. <laughs> <laughs> So that, so that I imagine I have 80 friends in front of me. I'll be my friends. Okay, let's do this. So it's so, like a mini orchestra on the keyboard. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so... That's so, uh, <laughs> so, oh, yeah, so what a great I don't think story. I ever tell anybody that this year is my... Uh, what a great my story. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, I think maybe that could even help a lot of our listeners who are pianists because oh. I think... That's a lot of, that's actually a complaint I've heard from other pianists, which is that mm. sometimes they feel lonely. Um, mm. And that's why they love to play chamber music at least. Mm. Um, but uh, I, on the other hand, I'm quite jealous of pianists because I, I would love to be able to harmonize with myself, you know, when I'm well, playing. And you don't uh, have to carry, carry the cello, cello around. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, mm. well, um, Let's go to some other types of questions now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This one, hmm. I'm not sure if this is even something you want to touch, but I'll just throw it out there. How do you okay. approach agency companies? Is it very necessary oh, wow. to have the support from an agent or from the agency for an international musician? Well, I guess they certainly play a role, don't they? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> good question. Um, well, <clears throat> normally it's the agency approach you. Mm -hmm. Yes, you could approach them, but m most of the time, the one that actually working for you is to... Um, they found you and then, but then how to get found? The only way is make sure every concert, just imagine someone sitting there. There were times actually some agency came to me after a concert and I would not, I don't even know that he, uh, uh, he was there. Yeah. 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 So things have, or maybe <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. You know, it's, Oh my God. Wow. Okay. I'm, I'm happy. Or, or maybe from word of mouth or maybe the concert, Someone was there and then he knows the agency and recommends. And, and then um, work travel. Um, so I guess to answer the first part of the question, um, it's hard to say that how to approach them. Um, just make sure that you perform well. And uh, in my case, they, they come to you. Um, the second part is, is that important for international career? Um, yes, um, because they do manage the concerts, but, um, I guess for me, um, it's more like they, they organizing for, mm -hmm. for my life as well. That's fairly important. So they, they organize the concerts, uh, my flights and where I'm going and then the, the schedule itinerary. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess the point is, don't look at that first. Just be a good musician. Things will happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's a complicated system, isn't it? There are so many different facets, and every country has their own yeah. way of doing things. So you can't really prepare for it all. It's kind of like I, you said. Yeah, Trey, let me, let me go deeper on this question because from, um, from some of these questions, I, I, I guess you received is about competition, about mm -hmm. how to be a successful soloist, how to get yeah. picked, how to get an agency, how can get my career, how could be right. you know, rising from the top. You, I guess 
how to be a better musician is more important. How to play better, how to be a better musician, how to, then your colleagues knows that you're a good musician, words travel, how to uh, improve yourself, be a better and better every day. Then you play this piece five months from now, well, oh wow, I think I found something different today than five months before. That's more important. Then, then, uh, and then when you focus on that, all these other things, the concert, careers, agents, competition, winning competition, uh, uh, being picked by his conductor, this thing would right. come. Yeah, 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 sure. No, absolutely, because a lot of times when we're so focused on success, we forget yeah, exactly, yeah. why we're doing, or what we're doing. <laughs> so, yeah. No, I, I mean, of course, at the same time, I, I do understand where these questions are coming from because the music mm. world has never been more competitive than it is today. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people are worried, genuinely worried, you know, how yeah. will I be able to stand out and things like that. And, um, yeah, but like you said, if you don't, if you're not a good musician, you can't even worry about that other stuff, right? Because Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's true that there's so much competition, um, but yet, I guess, um, yeah, having the right focus, and then don't forget that for being a musician, the one thing is very interesting is we are, it's not like a, being a doctor, lawyer. There is plan. After seven years, you become a doctor and then you become you know, a lawyer. You pass this bar and that's a procedure. For musicians, yeah. everyone is different. How they find a career path is different. I'm happy to share. And then I guess we all look at how other people's career path. But eventually, you have to find your own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I remember my teacher always, always <laughs> said that there is no, there are no two careers with the exact same path in music. Yeah, there exactly. Have never yeah. Been, there have never yeah, been. Right. Two, right. You know? Okay. Well, here's a maybe more fun question. As a conductor, what's your typical day like? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Typical day like, not like in during COVID. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, typical day, like, um, in general, I fly out on Sunday. Uh, so I arrive sometimes Sunday night or maybe Monday. And then I'm in a different city. And then I would first thing I check in hotel and I start looking at the score again. And then the most of the time Tuesday, we start rehearsing. So it's morning rehearsal, afternoon rehearsal, and then evening, I would uh, eat something and just go back to the score and do more studying and try to plan um, what I want to rehearse the next day. Um, yeah, and then there's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays like this. And then Friday, it's most of the time it's morning dress rehearsal and afternoon is free. I could relax a little bit and then evening's concert or maybe Saturday's concert. So yeah, so, and then after the concert, the next day I have to pack and then go somewhere else again. Uh, that's uh, a okay. normal week, uh, normally week, weekly procedure. But Leo, come on, you have to keep up this image of us musicians of having this glamorous life, right? <laughs> you arrive and the paparazzi's waiting. Yeah, waiting, uh, the red, red carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and then get my own, your own suitcase, and then it's yeah, like in the snow and tracking it in the snow, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're going to three-star restaurants and, you know, fans. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah. think like you said, a lot of it is, you know, this goes back to always trying to be a better musician, isn't it? I mean, you're even after rehearsal, you're back in the hotel studying the score. Or if you're an instrumentalist, you're back in your room, hotel, mm -hmm. practicing. Yeah, practice, yeah. Um, it's basically nonstop work a lot of yeah. times, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then when yeah. you have right. time to enjoy a little, hopefully, you know, if you're traveling to an interesting place, maybe you have an hour to look around yeah. or to enjoy something. <laughs> yeah. But Trey, yeah. what did you do that sometimes even though you are enjoying traveling and then suddenly use your mind still back in the music again and yeah. singing, right? Yeah, that happens right. all the time, right? Yeah. So exactly. it's nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. 
But, you know, hopefully sometimes you have a little bit of time for fun as well. Oh, yes, of course. Know, of, of life course. cannot be all about just work, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of COVID, uh, there are two mm. questions here. I think that might be related then. You know, what is the biggest challenge as a conductor during the pandemic? And then the other question is, how do you see the future of conductors? Well, well I mean, this is... Wow. And right now, you know, how <laughs> do we see anything, right? <laughs> mm, okay, um, let me get my crystal ball. Okay, what's the future? <laughs> <laughs> so how's the let future me put with it this way. Uh, like during the pandemic, how, what have you been doing? You know, what have you been doing? A lot of studying, a lot of planning, a lot of virtual meetings and stuff. Oh, I had a great time. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> So, yeah, I was, I was, I finally had time. Well, of course, I, I keep studying to prepare for next season. Um, but, and then I have more time so I could go to Wix Surf. Uh, I could learn uh, making coffee in my friend's uh, coffee, coffee shop. Uh, so I, and yeah, learning golf. So I have more time to do things that oh, I always wanted to do. So it's fantastic. Um, oh. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, coming back to the question, well, <laughs> the future of conductor, um, well, that is a big question, a big one. Well, um, I suppose there are different ways of looking at it, right? Because in yeah. America, there's always talk of the conductor having to be like an ambassador for a city. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right? You go into the yeah. community, you get more mm -hmm. of the young people involved, you have to do fundraising, you have to do, yes. you know, on top of your job as a conductor. Right, a, right. Um, uh, and then in the 21st century with online content now, a lot of conductors perhaps also need to be more engaged that way on social media and things like that. I don't know if you're doing any of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, has, conductor has to be with the community. Have to with the. Um, I remember Robert Spano. He, he was in uh, Atlanta. He 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 told he told me, well, if you're a conductor of a music director of a city and you don't move there, it's it's a, it's a sin. You know, you should not do that. You have to you know, live in the city, live with the people because that is your audience. Um, um, yeah, it's so true. A conductor, um, not just for the future, I guess, uh, has to be with the community. Um, I guess what the COVID changes a lot is now, I know we do a lot of media, a lot of um, sharing uh, online things. Fantastic. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure it helps a lot to spread classical music uh, around. Um, and then people will say, well, then do we still need live music and the answer for me, for me is always yes. Yeah. There's nothing to to um, compare with a live concert. I mean, it's just like when when they have cassette tape or CD, they ask question. Well, would people still come to concert? Yes, people still come to concert. So by having doing more of these media uh, or online or online works um, to share the music, to share what we are doing, but yet um, eventually. I hope that can still bring people back to the concert hall. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's... What do you I see? Mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, personally, I also think for classical music, so much of it is about the quality of the sound because we are yeah. able to make so many different sounds. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, as opposed to, let's say, electronic music, right? Mm. Um, so if it's not live, it's very hard to appreciate those differences in the nuances, the colors yeah. that the greatest musicians are able to do on their instruments. Um, so I think because of that, there's absolutely no comparison, right? Between live and online. Even with like a hundred thousand dollar speakers hooked up to your telephone, <laughs> it's not gonna be the same, <laughs> is it? Um, yeah. So I, I think, yeah, certainly the future is there for live music and um, hopefully we'll all, and hopefully you and I can play yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think Back play to concert play. hall, yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so, well, I, I think 
you know, I guess at the moment we can all just stay positive. I mean, you're in Taiwan at the moment and you said mm -hmm. they had a Turandot performance last night. And hopefully that will be a sign of things to come. Yeah. Um, and everywhere. Uh, so, well, I guess this, this is, um, hopefully we've left everybody with a somewhat positive and hopeful message <laughs> <laughs> here at the end. Be positive. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you so much because you know so many, so much of the things you said today are just very inspiring and also very helpful. I think to young people. Um, so I think that's going to be, yeah, something everyone could take away. And no, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Jay. Yeah, and we all look forward very much to your next live performance. <laughs> And uh, so that will be hopefully soon. And good luck with everything and stay safe then. Thank you. Thank you. And you too. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for, have, for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm. Bye. OK, bye bye. Right. So everybody, uh, just a quick um, announcement. Thank you for being with us here today. Our next um, uh, speaker on the series will be Hong Kong born and bred conductor Wilson Ng, who has a very, who has a really wonderfully entrepreneurial and inspiring um, musical personality, I think. So that would be very interesting to hear from him on September 19th, Saturday. Uh, so stay tuned and hope to see you there. Thank you. Bye-bye.